Sadness, uh, given that two speakers had, were forced to cancel for personal reasons, but we were lucky enough to have uh, Mislav as the joker in the back who could, who could also kick in and improvise something and contribute to the discussion, and Alberto also uh, uh, happily, happily uh, accepted to extend some of some of his more theoretical and abstract uh, abstract uh, uh, observations on equality to a more concrete discussion of equality. And I also prepared uh, a, a rather lengthy uh, moderatorial introduction to thematize uh, different ideas of precisely what we were speaking about earlier, uh, uh, different conceptions of inequality between its linkage to the idea of society, to the idea of a pure politics or a pure political subjectivity, or uh, the, the, the attempt to, to uh, identify equality with a certain juridical uh, form of uh, uh, regulation. But I'm going to skip that, given that I, I would like to give uh, space to the panelists, and given that we are shifting to a more concrete topic uh, of the discussion uh, around equality, namely education. But I have a little green book, which is unfortunately not neither the green book of Gaddafi, nor the green book of uh, the benevolent uh, 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 organizers of the conference, but it's a small uh, set of short stories from Brecht called Geschichten von Herr Koina, where I just wanted to read uh, one little parable which I think in a very, in a very provocative, uh, provocative way depicts some of the uh, questions, uh, implications or problems that we, we would like to address here in the panel. So, this is called, this is an entire series where Brecht has two characters, Herr Koina, uh, or Herr Nobody, and Herr Via. So Herr Koina is a staunch Marxist communist, and Herr Via is a liberal. And they're having a discussion about the public sphere, the role of the public sphere, especially the role of, of uh, public media and, and uh, uh, political mobilization, uh, 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 collective, collective political action, etc. So. Just, okay, so I will try to translate directly from German. So, Herr Wier holds men in high regard and he holds uh, newspapers as, as uh, uh, non uh, uh, unverbesserbar, uh, non subject to uh, a betterment or, or, or non improvable, non improvable. Herr Koiner by contrast, holds uh, men to be very low, and he holds uh, the newspapers as improvable. Everything can be better, says Herr Koiner, except men. So, with this, I would like to uh, introduce Karin Dulan, who is our first and only proper uh, uh, panelists from, 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 the, from, the, from those announced in the program. Uh, Karin is, uh, holds a PhD from Cambridge University in sociology, which she obtained in 2010, and she is a research associate at the Institute for Social Research in Zagreb, working on issues of uh, social equality in education. So, without further ado, Karin. Can you hear me well? Yeah? yeah. Okay. So I know you're very tired, but um, this is sort of a battle of mine I want to very much share with you, so you need to keep with me for about 20 minutes or so. Um, and, you know, I've been listening to uh, what you know, other presentations during the week, and I've been listening to all the different grievances that many of us um, uh, have here, and basically I want to add to this list of grievances, you know, we've talked about loss of public space to climate change, and uh, this grievance is the persisting problem of social inequalities in education, and then related to that, social inequalities in society more generally. Um, now, what do I mean by uh, social inequalities in education? I'll just start off by giving you um, two um, extracts from the media, um, sort of contemporary extracts. Uh, the first one relates to the protests taking place in Chile. Um, and these are protests for educational reform. 
Um, and according to an article that reported on these protests in The Economist from last week, there was a campaigner uh, who said the following. The posh kids from the posh suburbs study in those suburbs, go to universities in those suburbs, get jobs as company executives in those suburbs, and employ friends from the schools they went to themselves. And then he's also quoted to have said, rich pupils get good private education, poor ones are condemned to underfunded, dilapidated, state-funded schools. And I think he uses a very interesting term to sort of capture this. He uses the term educational apartheid. And he says that this educational apartheid is widely blamed for the fact that Chile remains a highly unequal society. Um, so he's a rather sociologically insightful campaigner, I would say. Um, and basically what he suggests is that there is a socially stratified educational system in Chile, which contributes to this broader uh, social divide by privileging the already privileged and underprivileging the already underprivileged. So that's my first example, and the second example um, was sort of related to the London riots, and it comes from an article in The Guardian um, from the August the 16th, and it's an article by Melissa Benn, and she basically talks about a similar situation in Britain. So I'm quoting her, the gulf between schools educating the well-off and the disadvantaged has never been bigger and things are only likely to get worse in the coming years. It's now, of all times, that we need a larger, more generous vision of education and a keen awareness of the vital function that schools play in knitting together disparaged communities, disparate communities. So basically, like the Chilean um, campaigner that I just uh, quoted, she also notes a socially stratified uh, system of education. Um, but what's interesting, I think, in her statement is that she sort of talks about education as a tool of social reproduction, but also as a tool of social transformation. So this is this, you know, it plays a role in knitting together disparate communities. So the statement of the problem, you know, just from these two media articles is rather clear, you know, this is what basically we know, we live in unequal societies and um, educational systems reinforce this um, and they don't do it in a meritocratic manner, um, as some would like to believe, so by ability, but rather, um, in, like in these examples, by wealth, so we have the sort of rich, rich poor pupils. So, um, this is the beginning of my presentation now. This was a sort of teaser. And just to help you follow the presentation, I'll give you a framework. So if you get lost along the way, you'll be able to plug in. So what I'm going to sort of talk about first is uh, move away from media messages to give you some empirical data um, uh, that shows more specifically what I mean by um, uh, social inequalities in education. And then I want to um, give you some of the explanations that exist in the sociology of education for why these social inequalities um, uh, are visible. And I want to sort of um, critique um, the lack of um, education uh, policy to sort of this issue of social inequalities. And then finally, I want to try providing an alternative discourse. So, you know, this is a sort of difficult job, but um, trying to think about, you know, what would be an alternative discourse to this neoliberal agenda in education. So to start with sort of this um, first part, you know, social inequalities in education through empirical data, um, basically, um, you know, a significant body of research in the sociology of education has over many um, decades now observed significant differences in the educational choices, um, experiences, and academic outcomes of students who belong to different socioeconomic backgrounds. Um, so, um, I mean, basically, when I say different socioeconomic backgrounds, this is rather quite flexible. Authors talk about class distinctions. But um, I might, my talk is going to focus on this sort of class aspect, although, I mean, it's important for me to say that class is also interrelated with issues such as gender, uh, sexuality, ethnicity, but um, I'm sort of going to... Um, um, try and focus a bit more on, on the class uh, class aspect. 
Um, and what I'm going to focus on when talking about empirical data is on higher education access. And this is actually sort of a hot topic now amongst researchers um, in um, what we call developed countries. I mean, issues about social inequalities in education in developing countries are still about access you know, to primary school and uh, secondary school. Um, so my focus is unfortunately more, I guess, on the, on the sort of developed um, context. So, um, with regard to equality um, of access uh, to higher education, what we mean by this is a comparison of rates of access with respect to students' uh, socioeconomic background. So what we find in most OECD countries um, is that there is a strong correlation uh, between um, the probability of a young person obtaining a university degree and the educational qualification which is held by the, the, um, by the person's parents. So Euro student data has very recently come out. I don't know whether you're familiar with the survey. So it's a survey examining the social profile um, of students across uh, different countries, 25 countries where actually involved in the last year of student survey. And um, if we look at the educational level of students' parents, um, we find, according to this report, um, that only a few countries can be classified as socially inclusive. And so the countries that are listed as socially inclusive are Ireland, the Netherlands, Switzerland, and then it says in this report possibly Finland. And Croatia in this context is classified as socially exclusive. So, um, what does that mean that it's socially exclusive? That means that students whose parents have a higher education degree are overrepresented in the system of higher education, and those students whose parents have not gone to higher education are significantly underrepresented. So this is this issue of, you know, who manages to get into the system, but even when people get into the system, there's a further issue of the social distinctiveness of branches within higher education. So what we see um, is that um, uh, students um, coming from less educated familial backgrounds tend to also end up in the sort of less prestigious um, university courses. So what I, what I sort of want to say by um, this kind of, the reason why I'm giving you some empirical data here is because I think it's important to show that, you know, the media articles were talking about social inequalities, you know, from sort of lay perspective, uh, you know, a sort of lay observation. But um, what we find is that, you know, there's empirical evidence for, for, for these observations. So, um, so that's a sort of statement of the problem, I guess. Um, and what I want to move on to now is, you know, how do we explain this? So, you know, how do we explain that we see this situation in access to higher education? Um, and basically, um, you'll find uh, sort of different factors, you know, uh, listed in um, uh, sociology of education uh, uh, books. You know, this, it usually starts off with a psychological work um, in the first half of the 20th century, which tried to explain these observed social differences by using the concept of intelligence. So, you know, the assertion was that lower class pupils were generally less intelligent than those pupils who come from sort of more educated uh, backgrounds. Now, um, you know, sociological work has, you know, empirically and theoretically rejected this, but very recently I was presenting Euro student data um, in, um, at the University of Rijeka, and um, one of the issues, so the Euro student um, survey is, you know, a fixed survey, that, a standardized survey that um, so all countries have the same uh, questionnaire for comparative reasons. And um, someone asked us in the audience, you know, yeah, you're telling us there are social inequalities, but have you, you know, have you looked at intelligence? So, you know, this is something that's sort of still, um, you know, that's, that's sort of still around, I guess. Um, but in the, so more prominently, these sort of, these intelligence claims were rejected in the 1950s and 1960s. And what happened then, that the emphasis on explaining was placed on sort of the familial background. So um, the assertion was that um, these students who um, sort of come from um, lower classes, they come from backgrounds which are culturally, financially deficient. 
um, and therefore these sort of you know familial settings don't provide the cognitive and attitudinal socialization that's required for someone to succeed in education. Um, so it was a sort of quite you know blame the family sort of you know discourse. Um, but actually moving away from blame the family discourse, research has started looking at education, um, at, at the educational system. And they started look at, looking at sort of what are the organizational barriers that prevent someone from sort of um, succeeding um, in the system. And by the 1970s and 1980s, you had a very strong, in sociology of education, there were very sort of a strong Marxist discourse coming into explanation into these explanations and this was a far more radical critique of the educational system and um, a prominent author's um, uh, sort of of um, you know the role that the educational system has um, in reproducing and legitimizing social inequalities in order to legitimize you know capitalist economy um, were Bowles and Gintis and there's a famous book that that they wrote that was published in 1976 and um, it was called Schooling in Capitalist America and um, basically you know what they say is what the Chilean campaign there I quoted at the beginning said um, you know which was that you know there are schools for working class pupils that prepare them to get working class jobs whereas um, young people elite um, attending elite schools are prepared um, for future managerial and professional occupations. Um, and according to these authors, this stratified educational system is um, legitimated, and now I'm just going to um, you know, quote, so it's legitimated through the promotion of an ideology of meritocracy, which, they contend, renders economic inequality acceptable by promoting the belief that poverty is a consequence of innate personal uh, failings. Um, so basically, if you're poor, if you're not doing well in education, you know it's up. It's it's about you know um, it's about your ability rather than any other structural constraints that might be preventing you from sort of fulfilling your you know, potential. So I just want to talk a little bit about my own research work because I sort of examined in the major I guess research I've done so far this issue of social inequalities in access to higher education and then how students in their first year of higher education who belong to different socioeconomic backgrounds experience this first year of study um, and what are some of the um, organizational um, issues that support them or, um, or thwart them in their progress. Um, and since I've been talking about access to higher education, I'll focus on that aspect of my research. So the research took place at the University of Zagreb, um, and basically what I found was that you know students whose parents have completed higher education themselves explain their decision to continue to higher education by using the term natural. You know, for them, it's sort of natural to continue to higher education. It's not a rational choice you know, as some sort of um, theoreticians would want us to believe, but rather, you know, it's sort of following the default educational biography. And, you know, in this naturalness to continue to higher education, they're supported by the secondary schooling they've completed. So, you know, these are students who have, um, um, to a large extent, completed grammar schooling. Um, in contrast, um, students whose parents have not uh, completed higher education, um, these are students who are more likely to go to vocational schooling. And unlike these more privileged students who, you know, uh, had this naturalness, for these underprivileged students, there wasn't a naturalness to continue. They sort of had to break with the educational history of their family. So for them, sort of important contacts were I don't know, teachers or other sort of significant others. Um, and um, also then another issue, so apart from, you know, parental support um, or, you know, this kind of encouragement to um, continue to higher education or completed secondary schooling, we know that finances play a very big, um, you know, a big problem. And in this survey that, um, that I... Um, uh, that I conducted, there were very few students who estimated their family's financial status as bad or very bad. So, um, 
Now, what I want to emphasize here in particular is that um, what makes the situation much worse is that the educational system reinforces these differences. So they reinforce the fact that not all parents have educated parents. They reinforce the fact that all students don't have the financial means to be able to continue to higher education. Now, how do they do this is basically by being blind to these differences. So what you have is there's in lower levels of education, there's lack of institute, there's lack of provision, institutional provision about you know continuing to secondary school, continuing to higher education. Um, there's early streaming into vocational and grammar schools where you're sort of making a decision practically for you know what you're going to do um, uh, later. You had um, admission procedures at the time um, when I was conducting this study that were based on grammar school content um, and, you know, limited needs-based scholarships. So basically what happens is that, you know, for the underprivileged person to succeed is basically working against the system rather than, you know, being supported by the system to succeed. Now, um, a practical um, implication of identifying all these different influences is that, you know, if we want this to impact policy, what this tells us, you know, what these um, sort of different influences that I've talked about, both, you know, from this historical perspective and, you know, looking at my own research, is that you need very a very complex educational policy process to be able to support um, disadvantaged students. Um, so you can't just focus on economic capital, you can't just focus on um, the sort of uh, you know, uh, cultural capital being the educational uh, level of parents, um, you know, you, or, or, or just you know, institutional barriers. So uh, you know, for the weakest to survive, you basically need an amalgam of different, of different practices. So um, what I've tried to do so far is sort of give a statement of the problem, show some sort of talk about some data which supports that, and I now want to move on to um, you know education policy, um, and. Um, now, the question is, what does education policy do about this problem? You know, does education policy recognize this? And as you may um, know, the focus of current education policy um, interventions in most European higher education systems is along the lines of, you know, the normalized master narrative, i.e. neoliberalism. Now, what does that mean in practice in higher education? It means that uh, government subsidies are being reduced, uh, students are being constructed as private beneficiaries um, uh, from the investment in their education and therefore they're expected to pay for this education. Um, the extrinsic value of knowledge is emphasized, so you know it's not about sort of personal development um, but rather about you know how this will contribute to economic development. Um, you have an increasing role of private business in um, uh, the private business sector in university governance. Um, you have competition among higher education institutions. So, you know, we now have all these world rankings where, you know, well, who's going to be the best university this year? You know, um, so this competition is encouraged. Um, accountability mechanisms are being strengthened. And um, what happens is that these institutions are being reconfigured as providers who need to respond to the demands of consumers. And what I think is a fantastic example of, um, uh, in particular, this issue of you know students as consumers is that apparently um, at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, um, they have when you choose your course now, you have a shopping cart. So like on eBay, you know, so you have this shopping cart and then what you do is you drag like, okay, you know, I'm going to, you know, social, um, macro sociological approaches, you drag it into the shopping cart. You know, I think that's such a fantastic illustration of, you know, this kind of consumerist, you know, ideology that's entering, the, you know, that's pervading the higher education space. So, I mean, what we can see in the education um, uh, policy process, I mean, the education policy process is contradictory. So you find sort of, you know, a mis mishmash of sort of different political interests, you know, within it. But what um, 
can be concluded is that in the 1970s, social concerns were palm, far more prominent on this sort of European higher education policy agenda um, than they are now. So, you know, currently as part of the Bologna process, there's something called the social dimension, which is practically the only thing that draws attention to social inequalities in education, and it was put on the agenda of higher education reform by students. So this isn't something that, you know, was agreed at ministerial meetings by the decision makers, but rather by, you know, student representatives. Um, so, uh, so the social dimension is there, but it almost seems as if it's there, you know, as a tag on. Yes, okay, I know, you know, we know there are, there are some problems, so let's put it there. But, you know, the issue is what happens in practice. Um, um, you know, how do you translate then this into practice? So, um, there's an article by Henry Giroux, um, which is called Beyond the Swindle of the Corporate University, and basically his claim is that, you know, in this neoliberal educational setting, matters of justice, ethics, and equality have once again been exiled to the margins of politics, and this is the title of my talk, you know, it's about educational inequality being a marginal political concern. So, you know, when you look at practice, you can also see how um, I want to illustrate to you why I think this claim I'm making that social equality is being overlooked is, and I'm going to focus again on the creation of higher education system, is, for example, the fact that um, um, currently, you know, 60% of, um, um, I mean, so uh, according to the Euro student data, 60% of students were fee paying. And um, what's also interesting is that um, before the 2010-2011 decision that the Croatian Minister of Science and, High and um, Science Education and Sports made this decision that um, no students at first enrolling will have to pay fees, um, before that, the way in which fees were determined was basically academic criteria. So how did you do in secondary school? Um, how did you do at the entrance exam? So basically, only academic criteria without this kind of social um, sensitivity. Um, and then this sort of merit-based system is also further than the latest decision whereby as a student you don't have to pay once you enroll, but then if you're not progressing academically, you need to start paying. Um, and um, now, the assumption that underlies this kind of policy decision, you know, and if we, you know, you know so my interest is always who is this decision benefiting? You know, for whom is this decision, you know, who, for whom is this decision made? And basically, um, you know, paying tuition fees according to how well you do academically ignores all these influences I talked about at the very beginning. You know, it's all, it, um, it totally overlooks the organizational aspects which impact, so whether or not you have a well-equipped library, for example, do your teachers come in time to give lectures? Um, you know, are you, can you go to um, office hours? So it fully ignores the organizational aspects. It fully ignores the financial aspects, so whether you're a single, and, and social aspects, whether you're a single mother, whether you're working while you're studying. So basically, you know, the, the contention is that successful progress is not just sort of a function of academic ability, it's also, you know, a function of, um, you know, so social, you know, um, much broader, much broader circumstances. And this is something sociology of education, you know, has been trying to put on the agenda for, you know, um, a very long time now. Um, and what I want to particularly sort of emphasize here is that putting this um, focus on the individual as explanatory for academic su success reminds me of um, I recently, that was my, my, my summer book was in another Salaitzel's choice. Um, and I've, I've sort of taken a quote from her. Um, so, so she says, above all, the self-made man in capitalism is independent from social constraints. With sheer determination and hard work, he could rise above the social and economic conditions into which he was born. And then later, she says, the idea that everyone can have prosperity and that those who remain poor just haven't worked enough. And I think um, this is an important point to make because um, it reminds us also of how we're constructed as individuals in neoliberalism. It's not just the technical aspects of neoliberalism, it's also about how it affects our subjectivities. And this is something that hasn't been talked, I think, a lot about during this week, you know, the construction of the individual as a sort of rational, selfish actor, um, you know, who is there to maximize his own profit. 
So um, I think that's sort of important to, to bring that in. And this brings me to my last last part of my presentation, which is about alternatives. And um, I was recently reminded in a book by you know this acronym that was um, that was associated with Thatcher, which is TINA, and it stands for you know there is no alternative to neoliberalism. Um, and you know, my that's I find that a very um, very worrying. So I, I'd like to think that there is um, an alternative, you know, to the educational setup and to the more broader uh, socio-political and economic setup. So when I think about, um, you know, how do I spell out this alternative discursively, I find Martha Nussbaum's work very, very insightful, um, and um, I would recommend her book, Why Democracy Needs the Humanities, as well, for people who are interested in this topic. But she makes a distinction between education for profit and education for inclusive citizenship. And for her, education for profit stands for, ne for neoliberal values. So, you know, economic growth under um, all conditions without sort of thinking about um, who benefits from such economic growth. And the, the vocabulary she talks about, this sort of other part, which is education for inclusive citizenship, is critical thought, a daring imagination, empathetic understanding, an understanding of the complexity of the world we live in. So this is a far more subtle, um, you know, attempt to define, discursively at least, you know, what kind of an educational system would be an alternative to what we have now. And so I would sort of like to translate that um, a bit more um, specifically. Um, and, you know, I mentioned a, um, a while ago the sort of, you know, what's the neoliberal agenda in higher education. So, you know, what would be the opposite? So the opposites would be knowledge as a public good, um, knowledge as intrinsically valuable, uh, university governance in the realm of the academic community and other civil society actors, uh, cooperation between institutions rather than competition in rankings. Um, understanding educational success as a function of interrelated factors um, rather than just it being um, a matter of academic uh, capability. Um, and I particularly side with um, Bowes and Gintis's radical call, and I'm quoting them now, for the dissident teacher, inspiring a sense of collective power and mutual respect, demonstrating that alternatives superior to capitalism exist fighting racist, sexist, and other ideologies of privilege, and criticizing and providing alternatives to a culture that makes you feel you're not any good, just born to lose. Um, and what I particularly want to take out of here is this, you know, demonstrating that alternatives superior to capitalism exist. And, you know, for authors such as Bowles and Gintis and myself, um, the remedy that's recommended for social inequalities in education is actually, um, you know, transforming, you know, society, um, um, society as a whole. Um, and I think this is what links all our topics from this week, sort of that's my feeling, you know, from reclaiming public goods to fighting social inequalities to addressing climate change, you know, what's sort of been a, an ongoing, I think, implicit message is that, you know, to do all of this, you need to, you need to sort of look at the uh, current um, um, economic order. So, you know, what do I think in practice? You know, this is... Um, you know, I'm also I'm sort of you know um, pessimistic when I look at how social inequalities are persistent in the system, and the fact that social equalities are not um, a, a topic of concern for educational prime well, an important concern for education policy makers. But then, you know, I also think uh, optimistically about the student protests, and I was very angry to hear um, Professor Pukowski, um mention that the student protests, you know, didn't, for example, address the Bologna process, because for me that actually misses the whole point, which is that these protests were the first protests in Croatia that went beyond particularistic interests, and actually, you know, okay, there was the issue about tuition fees, but there crucial value for me is in the fact that they actually were the pro first protests to articulate this sort of resistance to a neoliberal agenda and I think for that they should be you know very much recognized and that's not something that should be undermined uh, although Bologna process was actually part of the discussions that, um, that were had.
Um, so what I'd like you to go away with, you know, today is this issue that just like urban space or the environment, uh, higher education is also, not just higher education, but education is also a victim of um, neoliberal commodification, corporatization, privatization. Um, so there are things, in, you know, things in common that can, you know, bring people together to think about solutions together. Also that social inequalities in education are a problem with kind of, um, you know, a substantial amount of empirical work to support this. And um, that because there are so many external forces impacting these social inequalities, this is a problem not just of the individual, but it's also a problem, um, a problem of society. So that ends my lengthy presentation on social inequalities. Now I would like to move to two shorter statements. First, uh, Mislav Zhitko, who is, was very uh, was very keen to share with us both some uh, theoretical concerns uh, uh, regarding the student protests, but also some some practical experiences as well, which points to basically. Uh, 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 on the one hand, some of the issues that Karin was uh, was addressing, namely the the, the ways of the uh, of of of, of uh, uh, so social analysis and political ana analysis uh, in relationship to the transformations of institutions from within, concerning concerning uh, uh, education, concerning the, the, the inequalities of access to education, etc. And on the other hand, the the, the practical uh, basically invention. Of alternative uh, para-institutional or, 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 or marginal forms of self-education and self-organization, uh, 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 which uh, provides specific transformative potentials outside of outside of the existing institutional system, which also links to to some abstract theoretical issues that, that Alberto was mentioning, namely the idea that uh, equality uh, uh, should be seen not simply as an objective process, as, as a regulatory process, but something subjective. So namely, a starting point, something that, something, something that you declare, something that affirms, let's say, the imminent capacity of a collective, of a social group, to, 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 to produce uh, uh, without any uh, outside guidance as, you know, the, the idea of Emancipare, uh, emancipation, meaning to to draw someone by the hand. Uh, here, emancipation would be seen uh, in a, if it is seen in a subjective sense, it would be seen as something imminent, as something starting from a specific uh, affirmation of, uh, uh, of an, uh, uh, let's say, uh, an intrinsic subjective capacity. So, please. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, uh, right. Uh, I talked about. Um, Austerity and education uh, yesterday, a bit longer um, uh, discussion. Uh, and uh, obviously, I'm not going to bother with Pohovsky anymore. Um, I was invited here to uh, talk a bit about uh, student protests uh, um, that took place in 2009. Uh, of course, this is for me, uh, in a way, an uneasy position uh, because. Um, uh, I, I really have a strong dislike for this insider approach or um, this position in which I have to talk as a witness of the event. I simply think that uh, I have this uncanny feeling that my discourse is, uh, in, in the last instance, underpinned only by some kind of raw experience, and I find this epistemologically unsustainable. So I will try to circumvent it in all possible ways. Uh, uh, obviously, the, there was a lot of talk about uh, student protests, uh, a lot of analysis done about student protests in Croatia and elsewhere, and uh, a lot of uh, sociologists uh, and political theorists uh, thought of it and or have, have seen it as a uh, some kind of uh, uh, quote unquote uh, authentic political event. Uh, they, for instance, uh, Rasko Mochnik from Ljubljana talked about uh, this new class-conscious cognitariat that rose up and kind of seized the power for a month in Zagreb. And, uh, of course, uh, I would more or less agree with uh, all of this analysis, although I, I have some kind of uh, critical remarks. But uh, maybe, maybe uh, this, would, this would be a uh, uh, nice opportunity to say something different uh, in terms of what were uh, 
some kind of obstacles or problems uh, that um, arose out of this student movement and uh, the whole um, project of the occupation of the faculty and so on. And uh, for me, uh, I found uh, uh, Alberto's um, discussion very interesting because obviously equality played an important role uh, in this as, as an explanation or as a factor that legitimizes, uh, that legitimizes the student struggle. Uh, and uh, it is, and it was always uh, an important issue. And we always, the students that were actually involved in this uh, process, uh, we always thought about uh, equality as a uh, as a something that is theoretically uh, important, but also as a fact that uh, needs to be taken account in our you know, practical practical struggle. And. Uh, the, uh, for me, uh, now reflecting upon uh, past events, uh, it seems that uh, it seems to me that the student uh, protest and the occupation of, of faculty started as a some, uh, uh, under uh, under the shadow of uh, Jacques Rancière. It, it, it seemed to me that uh, uh, the student rebellion at first seemed as a as a, as a some kind of perfect Rancierian rebellion, uh, sort of. Uh, bunch of students and an, an anonymous group uh, took over uh, the faculty and moved radically into public space and uh, they did it with, uh, with uh, no uh, without fear of authority uh, and uh, uh, the public and uh, the, the dominant institutions were forced to acknowledge this uh, in a way new force but uh, as time moved on, uh, there was uh, a problem arose. A problem I would like to call, uh, or we could call it, uh, the problem of expert discourse. As time went by, uh, we needed we needed to think and uh, to formulate arguments about uh, our cause. What makes our cause legitimate? Uh, what makes it politically and economically sustainable? And so we, need to we needed to develop uh, uh, some kind of discourse uh, that would be based on some, some kind of facts, uh, uh, in, in best scenario, uh, some kind of numbers uh, or analytical figures that could actually support our claim. And, uh, and this is the point uh, at, we uh, uh, at which we had to depart from uh, Ranciere and we had to depart from thinking that this could all uh, end up well if, uh, if we just stick to this uh, ideology of spontaneous rebellion. And so, for me, this, uh, for me, uh, this uh, uh, opens up another uh, problem, even, even more uh, 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 complex. Obviously, I will not have uh, uh, time to uh, give you the answer or give you some kind of uh, a recipe for the solution uh, uh, to the solution of this problem, which is good because I don't have any. Uh, um, the pro so I find uh, that, um, uh, that um, historically speaking, there is uh, a kind of a connection between leftist discourse and different kinds of um, leftist projects and uh, analytical apparatus given to us by uh, humanities and social sciences. And I wonder to what extent is, uh, is this a good position for the left? To what extent uh, do these analytical categories actually uh, uh, restrain us from uh, thinking about social problems in, more, in a more pragmatic sense? To what, to what extent uh, does our inability to think about social phenomena in more, uh, in, in more uh, uh, pragmatic sense, in, in more economically viable sense, uh, restrain us from, uh, from uh, being more socially visible? And so I feel uh, that, uh, with this, that, that with this student rebellion and with this uh, uh, project, which, which was obviously leftist, uh, in kind from the very beginning, uh, we've opened a uh, 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 kind of a set of issues that were um, more or less uh, visibly present um, throughout the, the throughout the whole this period of transition, namely that 
uh, the problem that the left has moved into the university and has left the political field and indeed the economic field to the forces uh, outside of the university, namely the political and business elites. And uh, so when you're uh, with any kind of radical demand, when you try to put forward some kind of radical demand and you, and you try to get uh, the public to acknowledge your position, you are actually moving onto the terrain that was formulated by your enemy or an opponent. And so uh, this fact alone forces you to rethink every category that you actually uh, are using and to really think, think over all of the, all of the uh, notions and kind of uh, 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 theoretical discourses that you thought uh, would be helpful for your political engagement. Uh, and so I think that uh, my, my kind of uh, greatest uh, concern right now after all, all of these uh, um, things have passed uh, is to what extent will left in the, in the future be able to uh, take lessons from uh, the events of the occupation of faculty and student protest. To what extent uh, will, uh, will we be able to um, uh, kind of um, uh, re-transform uh, uh, our discourse in a way that it becomes more politically and economically uh, viable and, uh, and so uh, to what extent we will, uh, will we be able to take over the terrain that was, uh, that was uh, taken from us a uh, long time ago as Perry Anderson noted uh, that there was a development he called Western Marxism, enclosure of Marxism within the university. And I think this is a good diagnosis for the entire left movement. Uh, and so uh, I think that, um, in a way, uh, the main problem today uh, uh, for the struggles that will come uh, after uh, after this, uh, after this uh, that we have ex experienced in, in university, uh, will be precisely uh, uh, connected with problems of taking on other uh, parts of society or other parts of social structure uh, uh, and thereby tra uh, transforming our, ourselves, our uh, you know, political and theor theoretical doctrine uh, and uh, making our uh, um, uh, struggle more efficient and more, uh, in a way, politically proficient. Thank you. Thanks. Now we're going to pass to Alberto, who is going to give a reflection on the situation in Britain, on the one hand, uh, regarding the student protests, and on the other hand, uh, a sort of a commentary on some of the dilemmas that the left is facing that Ms. Lavalsa hinted towards. Yeah, I wanted to maybe start from, I think, what became a, a dilemma or a, an aporia or a problem uh, within um, the struggles in universities in, in, in Britain last, uh, last fall and which are in some sense or another though a rather weakened uh, sense continuing in the present. And that's uh, I suppose a dilemma about what exactly is the place of, of politics or more specifically actually what is the place of um, some more or less nebulous notion of democracy within uh, university struggles. And here I wanted the situation in in Britain, I suppose, this is well. I mean, it's different in all sorts of uh, ways. One of the uh, ways in which I think it has, um, at, le at least from the vantage point of the university that I'm in, uh, been rather different than uh, struggles as well elsewhere was actually the fairly large participation of lecturers' unions um, alongside uh, uh, um, students, and sometimes. Um, sometimes anticipating, sometimes reacting to things that were happening in the more, more specifically student uh, uh, um, side of, of things. And on one level, I think the question, I mean, if you ask the general question, you know, is uh, uh, democracy possible in or through or via university, however you might understand democracy, then the most immediate answer would clearly be no. Um, for a, a number of reasons, one of them, which I actually think is very interesting that, at least in Britain, hasn't been dealt with more explicitly um, is not just the you know hierarchical nature of pedagogy or what have you, but actually the fact that the university is uh, 
ineliminably, you know, il ineliminably until uh, uh, um, you know sufficiently vast social changes, a uh, mechanism for the uneven reproduction of labor power in society. And that's a kind of banal, but interestingly not often dealt with issue. I was very struck actually in terms of things that were being discussed that student assemblies and student movements, etc. that one of the traditional or like classical demands of student movements from the 60s onwards, uh, having to do with selection, grading, evaluation, etc., was almost not raised at all, which to me was actually relatively relatively shocking. On, on, on one level, this allowed for remarkable level of solidarity among students and lecturers trying to fight cuts and so on and so forth, but it remains, I think, a slightly repressed uh, um, point that somehow would seem to be at least prima facie something that removes the possibilities for solidarity after all, you know. If uh, uh, a little number that I write in a piece of paper can make the difference between somebody, you know, making uh, 15,000 pounds a year and somebody making 20,000 pounds a year, then the extent of power exercised by uh, um, otherwise perhaps not very powerful institutions, you know, individuals in uh, otherwise not very powerful institutions is considerable. And there's a further element which um, was really to what extent the, the natural, let's say, uh, consequence of forms of political organization in occupations, assemblies, and so on, was to try to affect uh, forms of institutional reform that could be, broadly speaking, seen as a kind of democratization. Now, in principle, I'm very, uh, uh, at a purely negative level, perhaps, very favorable towards this, but. Uh, in many levels, uh, we have a fairly long experience of how these processes uh, um, take place. Already in the 60s and 70s, the main point of discussion, uh, whether democratization in terms of participation of students in uh, managerial institutional decisions or indeed of lecturers, the main points were uh, raised actually quite well by Ernest Mandel in texts that he wrote in the 70s, which were the traditional problems about the difference between workers' control and workers' management. I mean. One thing is having a participatory role within constraints that you have no control over, like budgetary constraints. So, uh, and another one is actually having some level of political, uh, um, political uh, capacity that you can exercise. So if you take concretely the British case in a, in a condition of uh, radically uh, lowering uh, state funding for universities, uh, especially in particular the humanities, where it's essentially just been wiped out, one of the possibilities, of course, would be greater student and lecture participation in what? Well, in making sure that within the competition between your universities, your university suffers less than the other ones, so you can keep your job and your degree, etc. So, in a situation that has been systematically atomized by this mechanism of the student as consumer, the university as, uh, as competitor, and the lecturer within the university as competitor, the possibilities of finding uh, uh, democratic or egalitarian or political forms that allow for uh, a resistance to these forms of atomization uh, are, um, are, are particularly difficult. Uh, this is especially, it's worth keeping in mind, within a situation in the United Kingdom where, of course, universities aren't directly parts of the state. So going on strike in a university in Italy, and I imagine, you know, perhaps to a certain extent in, in, in Croatia as well, has a different status than going, you know, or occupying a university in an Italian or French case, it's occupying a bit of state land, so to speak. Uh, occupying it in Britain uh, in a university that's this kind of nebulous charity private organization that receives some funds from the state, but is relatively self-run by some nebulous council of people. That's a very difficult and different uh, uh, state of affairs. Um, so, um, in, you know, in, in many ways I think uh, Inevitably, the, the, the struggles that take place in, in universities are, you know, and I think this is one of their pedagogical elements there, of necessity contradictory struggles. I think, um, for instance, so much as one might fight for ameliorating the ways in which universities reproduce social, equality, social inequality, for instance, right now in Britain by fighting against the fact that universities are going to, if this continues, become increasingly uh, 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 racially homogenous spaces, gains that have been made by working class uh, uh, and minority access will be pulled back. And on one level, the question then is, how do you fight for that without, in a sense, fighting under the presupposition 
that it's a good thing that your job is to reproduce the labor market and that in fact you can do this in an egalitarian way. Because there's a very, it's very, it's almost impossible in that sense to get outside of a meritocratic discourse, a discourse of social amelioration, and a discourse which is immensely problematic, I think, though one still uses it. So that's kind of what I wanted to get at. I mean, you, the immensely problematic discourse of the university as the institution which functions as a buffer or as a compensation for a, a, a society whose every other mechanism of reproduction of which is deeply uh, exacerbating of inequalities. And I think that is both, you know, it's, it's both in a sense what gives the university because of the kind of ideology within which it's reproduced and the values that are, you know, projected upon it. It's what gives the university an interestingly tactical role within broader struggles uh, uh, within society, but it's also one of its, um, you know, it's one of its uh, weaknesses, even within the, cons you know, even within the domain of its neoliberal transformation into a domain of consumer choice, etc. This is taking place explicitly, still maintaining that ideology that the university is what allows to correct uh, 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 the, the inequalities in, of, of access to the job market, what allows to, to, to ameliorate those elements. Now obviously in the concrete sense, once, you know, one struggles for not being an agent of an exclusive and exploitative institution, and I think that's absolutely crucial, but I think it's, it's important, and I guess this might relate to Mislav's comments, what the, the broader, broader horizon uh, of it is. And I think the shift, which is very evident in the United States, from the university um, as a domain of, uh, of, ideologi of, of, um, of ideological and class reproduction of a particular sort, to the university actually as a much more directly financialized domain, where actually the point of the, you know, it's the, the, the ideological role of the university is not to create students who are not critical thinkers or to create students who somehow acquiesce into capitalism is creating people with 50,000 pounds worth of debt. That's a fundamental, you know, I think, and, and you know, the fundamental function in all, and I think one of the problems is also, again, how does one concretely engage in these struggles without, for instance, uh, um, overvalorizing the university as an institution? I, I, for one, don't think that there's anything particularly necessary, uh, you know, for, for people to be in universities as such. I mean, this is just a concrete fact of the forms of reproduction of our society. And within that institution, then, one struggles for particular forms of uh, more emancipatory practices, etc. But I think, um, I think the, the, the limit, to me, and it's a limit, a necessary limit of the kind of discourses one necessarily engages in, is to want to reaffirm the fact that this is a special, that this is the special like uh, oasis of a form of liberal humanism from which then the rest of society could be uh, could be organized. Because I also think the, the the further effect of that is to draw to oneself the typical accusations, uh, which are, for instance, accusations if one wants to engage in in, in, in statistics in a sense that basically. Uh, Working class people mainly pay, you know, like this is a, an argument that conservatives make all the time, but interesting enough, Marx made in the 19th century as well, that, you know, the working classes often pay in taxation for universities that they have no access to. And so that, that which has been a very strong ideological point by a pseudo fair right to say, well, then we should, because they're middle class things, we should turn them into consumers, you know, consumerist places. And I think that's why, in a sense, the, the politicization of those demands has to be crucial. I mean, to go back to the politics, social thing, in a, in a sense, the, the demand, the unconditional demand for public universities still has, a, I think, a force, as it's been shown in Chile, that uh, managerial uh, or ameliorative, ameliorative demands uh, uh, don't have. I mean, which I, that I don't think evades the question of how one makes pragmatic and specific demands, but I think Without uh, that uh, political, uh, without that political moment, um, then one might be stuck in a position of trying to make an argument that one in the end can't make because it's, you know, the argument that somehow universities make better people or you know this kind of is, uh, you know, I think is a deeply, deeply fraught uh, um, kind of position. Um, 
and I think in, in, in one sense then, I mean, having, having actually uh, been at one of those uh, fight assemblies in, in Zagreb and actually been asked to vote, by your sister, that, uh, to, vote, to vote for a vote whose, whose content I didn't understand, so this is democracy in a radical sense. Um, one of the things that's been very striking, at least in, in, in the British case, is that the points where the, the politics take place um, have been, haven't straightforwardly been in terms of the management of the institution, have been in, in, in actually very, vaguely Ranciarian and rather irregular moments, like the fact that strike pickets now illegally involve uh, uh, students and random people who walk in from the street, which according to British law is the big, you know, it's a, you know, a, a, a picket is something that can only do, be done by like eight people at a time, and you know, if, if, if anybody shouts at anyone else, then it's illegal, you should call the police, etc. One of the results of what's happened in terms of the student movement and union uh, activism has been the sort of repoliticization of things that were treated as the management of labor struggles. And I think that's actually, in one way, a, a particularly kind of positive you know, dimension. Thanks, Alberto. I think we have 15, and we can perhaps stretch it a little bit further, 15, perhaps 17 minutes for discussion. Uh, so I would like to invite the floor to this very interesting uh, 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 sets of problems to propose on, on the table. On the one hand, the very definition of, of or, or the, of the singling out of the university as a symptom of moment for a re-articulation of questions of uh, more, radical, uh, more radical ideas about equality to, to what Mislav was, was, uh, was uh, pointing towards to uh, uh, the, let's say, a lack of specific forms of public address on, on the contemporary left and the necessity to, in a sense, uh, 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 not simply repoliticize uh, repoliticize things in, uh, through general general universalist discourses, but also give very practical, pragmatic explanations and arguments which might sensibilize uh, uh, the, the public sphere for 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 uh, more uh, uh, more uh, left uh, arguments to uh, the the perils and the limitations of of. Uh, the university as a site of struggle in itself that Alberto was, was mentioning. So, please, any immediate questions, comments? Uh... Okay. Uh, I would like to thank all the panelists for this interesting panel and um, I think I'm going to comment because the, the contributions were very, um, I guess, stimulating but also diverse and it was difficult for me to formulate a, an explicit uh, question. But first of all, um, I will follow up actually on what you uh, said also in some of the stuff that Mislo said. Uh, we need to, I mean, we're at the end of this um, conference which is entitled The Crisis of Political uh, Imagination. And uh, I think it's um, you know uh, very lucky and appropriate that we finish with um, talking about education, and this comes directly from what you've just been saying. How you know in a very simplistic way, um, education is the site of indoctrination and also emancipation. And and in that, um, as Misla said, um, the fact that the left has retreated to the university that is. Um, contributed to our lack of uh, thinking of alternatives. But at the same time, um, the universities, we can say, are directly to blame for the uh, homogenizing of assumptions and the naturalization of the uh, dominant ideo ideology that we have, because we can have, we can draw pretty, pretty direct links from you know, the University of Chicago and um, prominent intellectuals and professors to elaborating the platform for Thatcher, Reagan, and so forth. So uh, we definitely have this link uh, where we can say the university is to blame and the university is also the site for articulation. And in that sense, um, it's great that uh, the University of Zagreb has been a site of uh, mobilization of political struggle, but I, I would say that its um, primary role now lies in articulating uh, this wider, um, articulating what is uh, what we can see as uh, similar in all these types of struggles that we've been talking at, uh, about at this conference and trying to name them as the public good or the commons and so forth. Thanks. Can you comment on that? Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. 
Um, yeah, I just wanted to say that, you know, the way in which sort of we've talked, um, I think, a bit about the university here is almost in a, in a sort of, um, uh, you know, as, as, as a, you know, as if, um, I don't know, uh, the interests within the university are kind of quite homogenized. But the, the reason why I think sort of neoliberal education policy has been so successful is because within the university, it serves someone's interests. And so, you know, that makes it a more complex space. And so when we think about it, you know, as a site of struggle, you know, within it, there are struggles and, um, you know, if we think about um, the relationship now with the social sciences and humanities in relation to funding, you know, and then the natural sciences, there was the whole issue when there was the right to education. I mean, will faculties like the Faculty of Economics and some other faculties, you know, who will be supporting, um, you know, the right to education? So I think one of the things we need to bear in mind is the, the, the sort of, um, you know, how within the university there are different power relations, which also impact how successful policy um, goes through. But also, I think something that um, I wanted to mention in my presentation, which I forgot, which I think is important, is how, um, you know, um, a lot of critique is directed in education, you know, with reference to education policy in Croatia to the Croatian government. And if we again sort of think about, you know, different power relations, I mean, the, the education policy, the two main, if we think about main documents in Croatian higher education, they're written by, you know, the World Bank, the OECD. So, in a way, education policy is removed from national context to supranational context. And so, you find that national education policy and is, in a way, almost, you know, in a subordinate position to this. You know, so there's also, you know, issues of resistance at national level to sort of supranational, um, which I think, yeah, makes the, you know, yeah, ma makes, makes the struggle even, you know, more difficult because the addressee is even further removed than um, the addressee used to be. Uh, yeah, just, just a little uh, comment. Um, yeah, the, the name of the conference is Crisis of Political Imagination, but uh, I think that uh, this crisis of political imagination is a direct consequence of the crisis of capitalism. I mean, this is a kind of... Uh, uh, the, the crisis of capitalism for us on the left entails uh, the crisis of political imagination, and I mean, we can learn so much, as you said, from neoliberals, because they were on the political and academic margin for quite some time, for decades, actually, and they were struggling and uh, organizing themselves until they, uh, they were in a position to, uh, it, to take over the society at large, right? And uh, so, um, uh, with regards to these problems relating to, to the university, I think university is a powerful tool. It is an ambiguous, but it can be uh, a powerful tool. And uh, I was kind of trying to uh, accentuate the pragmatic dimension of the struggle. It is important, in the end, to uh, simply to ask uh, 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 two questions. Uh, what are the pressure points when we are engaging in, in some kind of political struggle? Uh, and what, what power we have and what power we don't have? And so these are kind of common sense notions uh, and I think uh, good entry points to really orient, a, orient ourselves uh, in the political and economic field. Because uh, when we look at the history of the left, uh, you can interpret it in a way as a history of confusion, uh, especially the, the period of 1980s and 1990s when capitalism was in fact stagnating but the financial markets rose, and this uh, this confused uh, left to the incredible extent. I mean, first, some theoreticians said, well, the class, uh, this whole uh, this class and class struggle is over, there's no more class. And then they said, well, there is no more industry, we are now living in industrial society, post-industrial society. And in the end, uh, came Jean Baudrillard and said, well, there's no reality. <laughs> and so we can all go home. And, you know, and so uh, we are kind of used to this uh, quite static uh, social surrounding, which is now 
which, which went on uh, uh, reproducing itself through 1980s and 1990s because of particular economic or political co configuration. But now this is all over, and we are now faced with same old questions that uh, people uh, in the in the uh, Robert Barron period in the United States are faced. It's the very, very extreme um, uh, social inequalities that uh, that are a natural um, result of capitalist mode of production. Any further? Primus. Thanks. Uh, I have a I have a comment for Karim. Um, about knowledge being defined as a public good, as a, you know, as a means or a way out of neoliberalism, uh, you were you were focusing exclusively on this um, pedagogical dimension of university, where mentioning public good in the in the era of increasing tuition fees and commodification um, might actually be just mentioning knowledge or, uh, as a public good. Uh, might be seen as progressive, but the problem is that this pedagogical dimension of university is actually losing credit. I mean, the a global tendency is for a, um, uh, for a pedagogical dimension to lose importance within the university as an institution, and it's actually being squeezed out. It's being um, the actual tendency is to, to restrict access to the university and to keep the students on, on board for as less time as possible and to feed them some standardized pre-made courses. So, uh, to shrink this pedagogical aspect as much as possible and at the same time you have this uh, expansion of the research dimension of the university where uh, defining knowledge as a public good without being very careful and precise how, how you define this uh, public good uh, can be much more ambivalent because, uh, for example, private capitalists would be all too happy to have knowledge and innovation as a public good because this allows them to, uh, to dump costs of research, these unpredictable costs of technological innovation or marketing strategy to dump it on public institutions and to have it funded by the governments and to just pick up, um, pick up ready-made innovations or new technologies when they are all already produced. So um, right now I think the dominant tendency, if you read carefully the documents from OECD recent documents or uh, plans for innovation union from the European Union, is precisely this, that university has been an ivory tower for too long, that it should become more open, accountable and responsible towards society, which means, um, which basically means in very pragmatic terms that it should provide uh, provide useful and commercially applicable um, innovations for private industry, more or less. So, so in, this, in this sense, uh, just existing on knowledge as a public good um, is seen in core with all the, uh, let's say, uh, the new generation of neoliberal economies who have no problem. Uh, with defining university as public institution or knowledge as public good. I mean, this is just a point of consideration uh, because nobody mentioned the research aspect of the university, which is becoming more and more important in these strategies. For example, in the new directives from the European Union, um, university is exempt from austerity measures, so it is strictly, strongly recommended that um, um, government government investment in, in research dimension should be encouraged while students are left to pay for themselves and for the pedagogical dimension. I need to think about this comment. I mean, you know, it's um, I think it's a very complex comment. You know, you've, you've sort of brought um, you brought you brought different things in. Um, I think sort of in the way in which I've, I've, I've sort of constructed, you know, knowledge as a public good is in essence a kind of resistance to the ways in which it's um, being constructed exclusively as something that contributes to um, economic development. Um, so, you know, it's, it's um, uh, not just economic development, but also, you know, the benefits that the individual um, uh, can um, reap from, you know, getting a university degree, um, rather than sort of also thinking about um, what universities were traditionally thought of as, which is more about 
um, you know, whether or not that was happening in practice, but more about these issues around citizenship and uh, social responsibility and knowledge dissemination. Um, so I guess, you know, um, it, it's, it's a sort of discur discursive resistance to um, uh, uh, taking away from the university um, that which I think is sort of essential to it, rather than you know encouraging people to enrol solely because of um, what's going to happen on the labour market, and not thinking about it more broadly in relation to you know the fact that certain uh, cognitive skills are developed much later, much later on, um, which could then you know benefit the individual's way of um, you know social critique and so. Alberto had a comment as well. No, I, I think, I mean, this has become very evident in debates um, in, in the UK and elsewhere that I think when, uh, when involved in these kind of struggles, one is always stuck in this, um, I guess, kind of inevitable antinomy where on the one hand, um, there's this demand of usefulness, which is, you know, uh, uh, articulated in different ways sometimes as uh, economic uselessness, uh, use, usefulness, sometimes as um, political, social, etc. So, in terms of research, this is now um, explicit within a, a United Kingdom context, where your research is supposed to be calibrated in terms of some vaguely defined impact, which actually in the UK turns out to, in many ways, be more um, <coughs> measurable if you do stuff for government than for private companies. But you know, certain type of stuff for the government. Now, the reaction to this, I think, is very problematic because the reaction is to try to revive um, a form of, um, you know, liberal aristocratic knowledge for knowledge's sake, which is not going to persuade anyone, uh, or I think a quite, a quite you know, a necessary but nevertheless very contradictory uh, notion that what you are producing is is the critical citizen. But of course a critical citizen has no place where to be a critical citizen since their social life is mediated by market relations and to think otherwise wouldn't be very critical. So, I mean, and I think that's the problem because you're sort of um, to, um, you know, to, to, to present the university as a, as a, as a solution or as a, or as a pro progressive force I think would be very problematic. What I think is instead uh, has taken place in ways that are positive is that people have latched onto things that I think are contingent byproducts of universities like critical thinking, which I don't think is essential to a university, but just so happens that in some places it has occurred, and have valorized that but in a fairly antagonistic way. Um, so, you know, I, th I think, you know, I, I think this is where the sort of like the public dimension becomes very, uh, very, very unstable, because it's, it is almost under present conditions, I don't, think, I don't think there's a serious, I don't think there's a serious social or economic argument that I could make about why I should have a job. You know, I can, you know it's not an argument that I can, you know, I, it would be a totally, uh, uh, to me it would be a totally ridiculous argument to say that I have a social function, or an anti-social function, or, you know, you make an argument, you know, you can make an argument as a worker in a union about you know, the money that the university or the state is making off of you. And that's the only argument in concretely that you can, you know, that you can, I think, make within struggles that has a certain effect. In certain countries where there is a different ideology about the university, you can make an argument about the value of, of education to a certain public. But I think in the British case, what's happened, and this is the ways in which student and lecture movements have moved, in a sense, out of the university while remaining within it, is that they've become, uh, in a sense, to get to the uh, break point, sort of Plumpus Denken vulgar, vulgar arguments about wages and pensions and debt and, and, and so on, within which, obviously related to the kind of intellectual life that takes place in universities, but not as arguments that are explicitly about the university as a, as a public good. Those have been arguments generally made, actually, interestingly, in Britain, by um, people at universities like Cambridge and, and, and Oxford, where there's a certain level of, uh, you know, uh, arguments about the idea of academics governing themselves, producing important eternal knowledge, and, and this kind of thing. Um, 
don't know about it, but I just think uh, I just think in the, in the struggles as they exist now, it's what's interesting is that specific movements that take place from within to from within the university to the outside of the university in Britain, most concretely, where where I teach, has been uh, you know student pickets going to places where they're cutting you know nurseries in the council, the library. So actually, the the immediate link has been to think of the university as just another place that's receiving austerity measures in the neighborhood in which, it's, in which it exists, rather than necessarily as a, as a separate domain that can actually engage in politics separately, which I think in this sense I agree with Mislav, though there are specificities you're, 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 you're forced in a sense by the logic of what you're doing to link with other labor struggles and other um, struggles of that sort. I can't help you with the argument why, should, why, why you should have a job. You could just say that you are blind because there is a demand in a desperate uh, <laughs> equilibrium of the market. I think, I think we can end the panel with that. Thank you. Thank all the speakers.